Hi, my name is John Vion. I am the PhD student here on the Integrated Wetland Management Project that's joint here with uh, Birdhaven Ranch and University of California, Davis. Essentially, my project is looking at better ways to control mosquito populations through more natural wetland management regimes uh, that kind of find a balance between uh, the need for pesticide use, uh, but also uh, keep public health issues at bay. Be sure to tune into yesterday's video where we kind of go over the background of more of the foundational pieces of this work in terms of the wetland management itself. Today, we're really going to look at the downstream benefits that uh, might come out of doing the different types of management regimes that we're trying to employ here at Birdhaven Ranch. So now we're going to go check out a wood duck box. There's a collaboration between my project and uh, the ED Lab uh, Wood Duck Project with Tanaya Russell. And what we'll essentially be doing is doing some of those checks for them as we go, so that way we can also get the eDNA, but also it helps their project out a little bit too. She rattled around a little bit, so she might uh, actually be in there, but we'll see. We'll open up the lid and um, climb up the ladder and poke our heads in there and see if she's inside the nest there. And I like to put the wood duck in the bag for two reasons. One, it's how we collect our eDNA sample. So to be able to get the sample we want her to, you know, when they get scared from being grabbed, they're gonna um, basically poo the bag. That's the sample that we'll use to study for diet uh, genetic material later. Um, but also it keeps them calm. So uh, when they can't see, kind of like throwing a towel over an alligator's head or over a deer's head or something that you know just keeps them a lot calmer so we like to do that um. all right so now we're going to work her up so we like to get a bunch of morphometric information from her um, so essentially wing length mass um, just we, that can go into different uh, measurements for you know body condition or um, just overall condition of the bird so we got all of our morphometric information off of her um, and uh, now what we're going to do is uh, put her back in the box and I'll uh, end up plugging the hole again um, and kind of let her sit and get settled so she thinks she escaped the predator um, and essentially that's what she's trying to do right now and that way she doesn't try to abandon her nest or anything it's always just a good practice she's based on what Tanaya told us she's about halfway through her incubation uh, process right now so um, we just want to be sure to make sure she stays within the box there and continues to uh, raise up those eggs. So I'll go stick her back in. Sometimes that hat makes a great wood duck plug while you're working. Lots of fecal matter. So now she's back in the nest and you know plugged it with a hat so that she's kind of hanging out in there and thinking she got away, but um, that's why I'm kind of talking low too, so she thinks she got away. Uh, but now we have all of her fecal matter in this bag, and that's where we collect because it's going to have all the seeds, all the uh, genetic material from bugs that we hopefully can capture with uh, genetic tests. So what we're going to do is uh, collect that, but we have to use sterile procedures similar to like if you were working in a lab or in a, in a hospital you want to make sure that your tools are clean because we don't want to transfer genetic material from an older wood duck capture um, or even if we were to capture another wood duck today you wouldn't want to transfer dna from this bag to that and then have a mixture of results because that genetic material is really small and it could come up in the data and uh, make it a little chaotic in terms of analyzing the data later on so and it, you can kind of see it there's like grit and sand and um, probably different seed particulates in there. So some of that will come out when we do all of our meta barcoding, so our uh, genetic testing to see what dietary samples are there. So we use uh, cryogenic tubes, which are basically like these tubes that are safe being frozen up to negative 80 degrees Celsius. And another interesting thing that I'll throw in is that um, thankfully uh, USGS donated uh, a few telemetry devices um, for the project because not only, you know, where we're curious about what they're eating. We're also curious about when we have water on and off and um, how much habitat fragmentation plays into, um, you know, not only the, the diet of the bird, uh, but also uh, production. So does that force, when we drain a wetland but flood one further away, does that force birds to have to use water that may have more predators in it? 
um, but also it gives us a sense of where on the property, how fine scale are ducks feeding when there's water available. Um, is it the unit right next to the box uh, and is she taking her ducklings there or is it um, a or is she going all the way to the northern end of the property because there's not much water down here other than the sloughs. So with that, we, we put telemetry devices out. We finally got them all to upload because they will upload via this or they'll record information via the satellites, uh, but they need a cell tower uh, connection to upload the data to the database. So we finally got all three to upload and we were able to find out that it's not necessarily, their movement isn't fine scale between the units, but it is within the property. Um, and we're able to see when an, some sort of event happens, you'll see that she has a brood based on her movements. And then some, some, a couple of them actually skipped town, so left the property. Um, so we'll be able to go back later and see, was that some sort of predation event or production event or, or, or uh, production issue event uh, where she basically you know, had her babies, but they didn't survive. Um, we're gonna look into accelerometer data and try to convert that back to information that may be able to give us some insight. So that's all pilot work, um, but it's, it's really neat to be able to tie the, um, the genetic material uh, from the meta barcoding and diet data potentially to the movement data. Um, and we actually have some really good people on the UC Davis campus that work with this data, especially grad students. There's somebody, uh, Mary uh, Badger on campus works with American Kestrels, uh, and she has some really good insight on uh, genetic diet material and how that can be incorporated into movement data. Um, so it kind of goes, to, she's going to uh, inform us a little bit on how to do that. So it kind of goes to show how different projects and different studies can actually turn out to inform waterfowl management and other waterfowl studies. So we've got all the information on there. So I've got the band number, the species. So we put the four letter code, which is W O D U. So WODU, that's for um, wood duck. And then we have the date of the collection. And then uh, we have the unit, so South Marsh, and then the box number, number 11. And we'll ultimately be able to relate that back to uh, some of our irrigation information. So not only telemetry data, hopefully, um, but we're keeping track down to the minute and hour when water goes on a unit, whether the swale is flooded or not, whether the swale is flooded fully, or whether the unit is full. And then we keep the same information for draining. So when the water goes down back to the swale, or if the water is you know, when it, the draining starts and then even when draining is complete. So we're keeping track of that fine scale information through time, uh, throughout the entire property to see if there's any trends uh, between the units and some of the diet information. All right, so uh, aside from the wood duck eDNA that we collect, uh, we're also uh, trying to collect some dietary information from fly catchers. So the black Phoebe is a bird that actually will nest on the predator guard underneath uh, the wood duck boxes. So what we can do is also get information from an entirely different species of bird and a bird that uses uh, wetlands in a slightly different way. So, you know, a lot of the wood ducks, although they might eat some terrestrial insects, for the most part, they're eating bugs out of the water column, um, even the ducklings too. Um, but in terms of the fly catchers, what's interesting is, um, you know, that's exactly what they do is they come off a tree limb and grab a terrestrial insect and then either eat it or they bring it back uh, to their young. So the idea is that if we're able to collect some uh, fecal matter from around the nest there, uh, making sure it's fresh, we can get some uh, dietary information about the terrestrial insects in and around these wetlands. So if you think about with some of the regimes that we talked about before, um, not only are we generating aquatic insects, um, those, some of those aquatic insects are going to emerge into some terrestrial form uh, that can probably serve as a food base for other wetland species other than just waterfowl. Um, and that kind of gets into the integrative wetland management piece um, of not just a duck focus, but um, having benefits to other wetland species. All right, so, you know, I'm the PhD student on the project and um, a lot of this wouldn't be possible without my advisor, John Eady, who actually oversees a lot of the work uh, that I get to do and actually is who uh, helped bring me out here. So John's gonna also talk about a little bit about uh, the 
more so seed production within these wetlands as opposed to, you know, I've gone over some of the, the waterfowl aspect of, you know, survival and reproduction as well as the entomological side of things. Um, and John's going to also be up here to do the podcast with us today. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to John. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yeah, you know, one of the great things about this project is it really is multidimensional. Uh, John's got his hands full with all the different elements. So John's talked about the different treatments and the controls that we have. And the primary focus was, you know, how do we manage mosquitoes in a way that still provides the opportunity to provide habitat for waterfowl and, and other wildlife, particularly during the summer. In the Central Valley used to be back in the day, this would all be dry except for oxbows and sloughs. So that's what this uh, this new sort of management technique, and it's all up to Andy Atkinson sort of dreamt it all up, um, is a way to sort of think about how do we manage mosquitoes, but also, you know, the goal of this at the end of the day is producing food for waterfowl. So this is all about moist soil seed management, primary species water grass and, and uh, smartweed, a little bit of swamp timothy, those are sort of the big three food plants for waterfowl here in the valley. And the trick is, you know, sort of you manage that by managing the number of irrigations, the length of irrigations, and that's where the trade-off with mosquito management comes into play. So, you know, ideally getting the water on and off in four days is what you want to do to manage mosquitoes, as John has talked about. That's pretty tough for a lot of managers. Ideally for the moist soil seed plants to maximize the production, the number of plants, the, you know, the quality, the size of the seeds. That's all about sort of uh, having um, irrigated wetlands, having uh, good, um, mo you know, moist soil conditions. And ideally, you know, five to 10 days of irrigation is where you're gonna get the most productivity. And we've done other studies, experimental studies, studies back east have done the same thing. Luke Naylor, who is uh, John's uh, predecessor, <laughs> did, did some of the first work here in the valley. So that's the trade-off. You know, you're trying to manage for mosquitoes, but you're also trying to do your job in producing food for waterfowl that they'll use over winter. And you can't do both equally as well. So part of this whole project is trying to find that sweet spot keeping mosquitoes down, producing moist soil seed, but also providing some summer habitat for waterfowl, migrating shorebirds, um, other wildlife. And that's, uh, that's the fun part of it. It's not just focused on food. It's not just focused on mosquitoes. It's focused on recreating a system that probably was something similar to, used to what used to exist here in the valley, you know, 100, 200 years ago. You'd have these little wetlands. They'd be flooded up, back, backwater sloughs, oxbows. Um, that would provide the summer habitat for, for all the waterfowl. And, and breeding waterfowl numbers have started to go down quite a bit, mallards especially in the valley. So something we need to keep our eyes on. Um, at the same time, we're trying to manage the water, the mosquitoes, and the moist soil seeds. So what we'll do here in the next few weeks, we're piloting some different methods. Um, we first will come out and do a quality assessment, and it's actually using some of Luke Naylor's, um, one of my former mentors, uh, uh, old publications and uh, looking at what's the quality of the moist soil seeds uh, out there, moist soil plants, and you know you have various species uh, within the wetlands. So we'll we'll get estimates on that, and then what we do is we go into the wetland and we'll actually take uh, samples from the seeds. So we go into random locations. Um, you know where we want to look at this from uh, north to south. So we'll do transects from north, central, and south so we can catch trends if there's, you know, an angle within the wetland, especially in the treatments where we have that 3% grade. Um, so we can capture, you know, wetter areas versus drier areas. How does that influence moist soil seed production and control for that? Same thing east to west. So you've got the swale that um, has an angle to it. And the idea is that within the treatments, at least that water seeps out east to west. So we want to capture those trends. So essentially within one of the north, central, or south areas, um, we'd find a random location and start there on the bank and we'd walk about 10 meters in. For purposes of this, I'll just stay right here. Um, but we would uh, do about five random quadrants um, out from that in different directions. Um, and essentially we would put that over our plants and we would do an estimate of the percent uh, cover. We would do the percent composition. We'd also do uh, height measurements, see how tall the plants are. And then we would, you know, of each species that we can determine or each genus, uh, we'll go in and actually clip about five seed heads from each. Um, we put those in a bag to be later dried out and sorted in the fall uh, with other lab techs um, to attempt to try and get production estimates on the moist soil seeds and then hopefully relate that back to the engineering of the wetland and how that might benefit uh, other waterfowl and wetland birds that use these food resources. Nice thing with these with these seeds too. I mean, they're pretty easily sort of assessed. The seed heads. Most of the plants we're looking at have these nice seed heads, you know. So with smart, we you can just imagine how 
when that dries out, that's a pretty nice food source for, mm -hmm. for a duck. Same with water grass, a little bit of water grass over here. Not a lot, but you can see when it dries out and, and, uh, and sheds the seeds, you'll get a lot of food for the birds. And that's what they're, they're feeding on. Mallards love this stuff, especially. So that's what you're trying to do, is you're trying to maximize in your management the number and the quality of these, these plants. Mm -hmm. The nice thing for John's work is it's easy to assess food availability for a bunch of these plants because you can just clip the seed heads mm -hmm. once they dry off. It's still a bunch of sorting and processing, but uh, you can look at how the different management practices influence seed production. Mm -hmm. And that's the name of the game. I mean, that's what this management's all about uh, at the end of the day, is producing food for waterfowl for winter. All right. So yeah, so typically in grad school, um, we all have our own influence. So like Tanaya uh, has, <laughs> works with wood ducks, so she's got the, got the wood duck there. And then um, Jackie as well. Jackie uh, works with all sorts of ducks and I've, would do her wrong if I didn't say that she's partial to pintails. And then you can see my very mallard centric um, uh, office space. And then with uh, the little wood duck influence after I moved out here to the valley, since I've started working with them. Uh, this is where a lot of my work in between my classes, you don't take classes as much as an undergrad. Um, but when you do, sometimes you're on campus all day and you may need to do research and collaborate with other people throughout the day, or you might have a bunch of meetings. So it's nice to have the office space because I can work. Um, on my research and then also um, if you're teaching so some grad students do a teaching assistantship so that's how they get their their funding um, so sometimes you're going to be teaching classes throughout the week and then you uh, may have to have office hours for your students so this is also a great location to be able to meet with students and um, go over work or if they have any questions and, and and talk about how they can excel in their classes so that's just a little insight into into the ED lab office space and we named it the duck pond because it's so fitting <laughs> and now we're here at the aviary that's run by the ED lab specifically Jackie Satter one of my lab mates and also Tanaya Russell who works with wood ducks here uh, in the ED lab and they're gonna tell you a little bit about their work here at the University of California, Davis. I've joined the ED Lab uh, last year during my undergrad at Davis. Um, and I finished up my undergrad and then continued with the lab. And I've been working on the very long-term wood duck project that has been going for um, upwards of 20 years now, uh, since the 90s. And so um, I work at several different field sites and I capture wild ducks in nest boxes and measure them and weigh them. Um, and ban them so that we know who they are. And then uh, other students in the lab and myself shortly <laughs> do um, data analysis on that. So there's some social networking project. And then I'll be looking at potential effects of climate change on um, wood ducks and initiation dates and things like that. One of the reasons that my project is going to focus on investigating kind of what um, climate variables or even box microclimate variables might be impacting wood ducks and their nesting is because in the past years um, Dr. John Eady who runs the lab that we're all in um, has noticed that multiple clutches are just completely failing especially, especially towards the end of the season um, and it seems to be somewhat related to heat um, when we have these like extremely hot weeks where it's you know 109 degrees every day um, that's above physiological temperature and so um, hypothetically the eggs can't survive that um, and thus they fail and so my project is kind of going to be collecting the data from all the years and then also using um, large-scale like climate data and also box microclimate data to try to investigate that and um, see if we can really focus in on like what factors are the most important. My name is Jackie. Um, I have been here for about six years. I moved to California from Louisiana um, in 2018 to start a master's program that quickly evolved into a PhD answering the duck question as a part of a larger carrying capacity study um, for a really large wetland area in the San Francisco Bay Estuary. Um, I study dabbling ducks and went through this really extensive process of collecting all the different species that co-occur in the area, analyzing their body condition and diets, and then subsequently using our captive aviary to compare all of their niche characteristics to the results that we found in the field to figure out what's contributing to their diet and why, hopefully, over the course of the wintering season. So why do we care about all this? Um, well, it's really important to dive a lot deeper into carrying capacity of an area and figure out all the different mechanisms that ducks are using to distribute food um, besides just the fact that they are 
different species with different types of bills of different sizes. Um, and there are a lot of other things that contribute to that over time, whether it be shifting nutritional requirements, like the fact that females need to prep for breeding um, differently than males do, or just the fact that the different um, species have different migration times um, and all that kind of lends to how we're managing the landscape, right? How can we best be putting food on the ground to benefit all the species simultaneously, both sexes simultaneously, and throughout the course of the season as evenly as we can. So in terms of just trying to further bridge the gap between waterfowl hunters and waterfowl researchers. Um, there are a lot of things um, coming to fruition slowly over the years. I know these things take time and they take personnel contribution, uh, but it is a really top priority for many of the government institutions that are involved as well as the academics to figure out a better way to be reaching managers, waterfowl hunters, the people who are on the ground and really care about this research that we're doing for the ducks. While we don't really have any specific Instagram pages or websites currently. We do have our lab emails and so if you're interested in our research and you want to connect with us, you're welcome to find those in the description. So here at UC Davis, we have a variety of species, primarily dabbling ducks that have lived here because they're easier to care for in this kind of environment. Um, but we've had the aviary program where hundreds of undergraduate students have gotten to come through and learn about animal husbandry, learn their different duck species, understand how they differ, um, and then we use them for research as well. We've been narrowing down our foraging ecology uh, mechanisms for our greater agent-based modeling system, um, learning what their the TME values of different types of foods are, and then testing those on the different types of ducks to figure out how those responses change depending on the species, depending on the sexes, and over the course of time. So now we can take a look at some of our duck species we have. So we have some gadwall, um, we have a few cinnamon teal, um, we have our pintail, my personal favorite, and a California staple. And then two pins of wood ducks. Wood ducks have been a really close to the heart of our PI species um, here at Davis. And like Tania said, over two decades of really intensive research on this species, trying to help develop um, our knowledge about them for the Central Valley. Another fun fact about wood ducks, um, there was actually a graduate student before me in the ED lab here at UC Davis. Her name was Nadia Dooley, who investigated what the size of the eye ring or the eye patch on female wood ducks means. Even though they look similar from a distance, up close all the eye rings are different sizes and shapes, um, and the amount of area that that white fills up on the face, um, especially as it evolves down into more male characteristics like the chin strap and things like that, means that those individuals are higher up on the family hierarchy. Um, amongst that group, so that may mean um, dominance in terms of priority for mating or in priority for feeding, um, but either way those females are more dominant to the other females. So you got to hear about Tanaya's wood duck project and all the cool work she's doing, and you also got to hear about Jackie's diet studies with waterfowl and some really cool stuff to be learned from there. You also got to see the aviary and all the ducks that the ED lab has used in the past and uh, the stuff that Jackie gets to oversee here and that's a part of the University of California Davis. Be sure to check out all the other videos in connection with this, uh, with all the cool research we're doing at the University of California Davis and Birdhaven Ranch. And with that, be sure to like and subscribe and see you all at the next video.